Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 17 of Tell Your Story, the series where I'm your host, Todd Nesloni, and I seek to amplify the voices of others, people who have impacted me or have heard their stories and just been inspired by things that they have been through and felt that they had a story worth sharing with you guys. I am so thrilled to have my friend and guest this week, Michael Bonner, on. So, Michael, I got to say, I, I, I am like giddy that you had time <laughs> to come on with me. So for and for the people who don't know who you are, why don't you introduce yourself real quick? My name is Mike. First off, I'm excited to be here. Okay. So just what I look up to. Let's just get that out of the way. Um, <laughs> uh, my name is Michael Bonner. I am a educator, a teacher. Uh, I'm a speaker. I'm an author, photographer, videographer, uh, but I'm mainly known for teaching. I teach second and fourth grade in Greenville, North Carolina. Awesome. Well, if you don't know who Michael is, you know, Michael had a video that went viral and he got featured or picked to be on Ellen's The Generous Show. And he got to meet Ellen, got to go dance with Ellen and Ellen gifted his school with some fun things. And, and you know, you, you've got a lot of eyes on you because of that national ex or international exposure, really. So, you know, I want to start the show with, you know, is Michael Bonner the same guy we see on social media, on TV? Like, is that really you? No, it is not me. It's a facade. Like, <laughs> no, um, to be honest with you guys, that, that is me. Um, the people, the person that you see, this this guy, this six five tall, smiling, uh, this guy that just loves kids and loves being around people, that truly is me. Um, but I have grown to become that person. And I can't just wait to just dive into that with you tonight because we know social media, there's studies that show Facebook actually leads to depression because on social media, we show all the highlights of our lives. We show our best lessons. We show our best pictures within portrait mode with the bulk and the background blurring us out. But tonight, I mean, I really just want to dive in and have an honest conversation with educators. Like, let's just, let's just really have some fun and, and put it all out there um, until how did I even get to this moment and even how success looks in everybody else's life. I mean, and I think that's the best way to start because you're totally right. Like what, what that social media does is we see these shiny pictures and we see all the smiling faces and we're like, dang it, they are so much better than I am. They have it all together. They've got the perfect class of kids, the perfect administrator or school or anything like that. And, and I know like you and I talk and, and we talk with our friends and it's like, that's not how it is. Not at all. No, not this is what I need people to understand. This is taking all the gloves off tonight. <laughs> hey, we want to get real with this. I really do this. Like, I wake up every day at uh, 5 30, 6 o'clock, even when I don't want to wake up. And I literally go to a classroom full time at a school that is 100% free and reduced lunch with gifted and talented, beautiful kids. Um, but I wake up every day to teach and make a difference. Like, and I think oftentimes, in life and when we get into this comparison thing and when we really begin to look at education everybody is not in the classroom um and everybody is not hardcore teaching every single day um and that can become a big strain because you're posting things or you're out here and and people are looking up to it but there's a difference between talking about education and then talking about education actually teaching and then actually dealing with serious problems that are going on every single day like i'll never forget the, the first two weeks of school we had a new kid come in. Um, everybody's excited. Everybody's elated. The new kid comes in. And I'm happy to have him. We're all adjusting to come to find out this young man is living in a one bedroom hotel with his five brothers and sisters. And I'm still mandated to teach him procedures. Um, but if you look at my social media, I have us doing the steam challenge and different types of things. So um, it's moments like that, man, that I just really want people to understand. This is more than just like a show. Um, it's more than just for likes and views. Um, it's more than just about being verified. It's really, at the end of the day, essentially about can you make a difference in the child's life? Um, mm -hmm. And that's just where my heart has been at time lately because you can sort of get caught up in this in this world of trying to continually do better. Um, specifically, being blessed with going on Ellen, my my username and hashtag name Michael Bonner is the same it was before Ellen. I haven't changed it to anything teacher related, and it's no shade to anybody with that. But at the end of the day, for me, I'm trying to keep my vein and focused on. Can I help my children grow academically, right? Because if we started putting uh, our test scores out compared to our coolest highlights and videos, you'll see a sort of shift inside of education, right? So 
that's just where my mindset has been at. Well, you know, and, and I love the comment you make about how important it is for you to still be in there with those kids and working with them with all the, the other things that we try to do in our careers because it, it keeps us grounded because, you know, you sharing that story reminded me, you know, just last week, I've got this kindergartner that he was in pre-K at our school, sweetest, cutest little kid, was always so happy. And in kindergarten this year, he's come in every single day, well, except for last week and this week, crying the whole first three weeks of school. And he would come in crying and he wouldn't want to go to class and he'd come and he'd latch onto my leg and he'd just stand there with me. And I was like, okay, you can stand here with me in the mornings during morning duty. And then, and he'd walk with me to class and he'd let me let him go, but every day. And then I found out about a week ago that the reason he was coming in crying every day was because he finally confessed to me and his teacher that his, his dad was back in the picture and hitting mom and he did not want to leave mom home alone with dad. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, this little five-year-old is coming to school devastated because he doesn't want to leave mom. And, you know, these are the battles that, that we face as educators is, you know, connecting with those kids. And, and that's why I love still being active in schools because it keeps me grounded. It doesn't let me lose sight of that's who I'm fighting for. That's why I want to provide, just like you, this fantastic educational experience because I want them to have that memory right. um, to hold on to. And that's and, and honestly, those stories like that, man, are really what keep me tuned in. Um, stories like that are what <laughs> make me. Because you know, Todd, from speaking, you can speak and do a keynote and then you can stay at the nice resort and stuff and enjoy collaborating and networking with all the upper ups inside of education to put yourself in a better position. But stories like that is what make me get back on the airplane and catch a red eye in the middle of the night when everybody's asleep and after they finish checking social media and finish hanging out and stuff with friends. I'm trying to get back to my kids because in situations like that, like if we look at that, that five-year-old is seeing domestic abuse. If we study the A study, which is becoming more prevalent now, adverse childhood experiences, they're showing that children that experience a traumatic moment like that or multiple traumatic moments within their life, if they have an A score of more than four, they are 12 times more likely to commit suicide, right? So our job becomes more than just, once again, who knows us and once again, um, how can I get my social media and all this stuff, but which is all important, right? Um, but at the same time, it becomes more of, am I truly making an impact in this child's life? You know, and that's why I often talk to my kids and let them know, you know, we know we do videos and we know we, we have special people come in, but I need you guys to understand, like, you're the forefront of, like, my main attention and everything I do um, is for you. This, this sweetheart in my class, they, they've been waiting for me to be their teacher and she made a Google Slides uh, document presentation. I wish I could share it with people, but she doesn't know how to make it, you know, open for everybody. But this sweetheart made a five-page um, slideshow about who, who her teacher is. She put why he goes out and speaks so he can put us in position to take us on cool field trips and provide us with experience. <laughs> the main thing about had me in tears because this this nine-year-old gets it, right? Yeah. Yeah. She understands, like, why am I working myself towards exhaustion to make sure she's good? So this is what I, that, that is why I'm in education, man. And and that's just one of my main purposes. What people see and the person they see on my page is not anything that is fake. It is, it is the God on his truth. Well, you know, and, and that's one thing that I've been really impressed by you about. You know, there's there's two things. One is, you know, when when you spend time with you and when you talk to you, you can see the genuineness that exists in you and how it's not a facade. It's not something you are just putting on for a show to get recognition for. It is true concern. I mean, when you Every single time I have ever heard you, heard you talk about your students, it's always my babies, my scholars, my, my whatever. It's like, they're yours. And what I also love is, you know, when you do go out and you are on your way back, you're FaceTiming them, you're Google Hangouting with them, you're sending them messages, you're recording videos, and like, I know y'all are gonna watch this. And it's like, I, I think that is very admirable because people in your position could just say, I can work the speaking circuit. I've got I've got some material. I can go and do that. Forget the kids. They'll, they'll be there when I get back. Full time. Mm -hmm. I mean, easily full time. I mean, the, the, I'm becoming more understanding other speaking realm and, and understanding how that business um, works. And I definitely want to give a shout out to my mentors, Ron Clark and Kim Bearden, as they've helped me guide me. 
through that, you know, because that's a new realm. People complain about <laughs> people complain about developing a lesson plan to be observed on. Imagine developing an hour long speech where people that are teachers have to listen to you. And we know that teachers are the worst teachers, right? Right. So that's a job within itself, man. But that's that's what keeps me ticking. That is what keeps me going towards my kids because I know at the end of the day, it is truly life or death with what I bring to the classroom. And I'm perfectly okay with that. I have fully, I, Todd, I have fully embraced, I am the educator that more than likely, I'm not gonna draw the biggest crowd. Um, because even though part of my speech, you know, I am entertaining and talking to them, there's gonna be moments I cover some tough things that we like to slide under the rug, but are critical if we wanna really make a change inside of the education system. And I've accepted that, that that's okay, you know? Um, but that's, that's all a part of this embracing who you are. Um, you talk about tell your story, man. In my book, Get Up or Give Up, and that wasn't a shameless plug. That book <laughs> was legit. The God Honest Truth. It's funny because people were throwing shade when I wrote the book. It was like, oh my gosh, how, how did you write a book so fast? People don't understand. I was a psychology major. Like, that's all you do is write 20 page papers on <laughs> bipolar disorders and the different mechanisms that the brain goes through. But in the book, I talk about growing up um, back at home for Quimbus, North Carolina, which I call The Trap. It's like chapter one. And what people don't understand is when I say the trap, there are certain cities and counties and school systems that are not equitable. And because they are not equitable, they literally and figuratively trap people within that county. Out of probably 10 people on my high school basketball team, probably only four of us made it out, meaning that we were able to go to college and get a college degree. And that's just mind blowing because for some people in some instances and some teachers going to college, it's just a normal thing. That's just something that you naturally do. But when I sit and think and look back at how many of my friends have passed away because they were in the area where they shouldn't be at, how many friends were out doing illegal activity because they didn't understand the value of education, how many friends sort of just cruised through school because they didn't understand how much education can truly change their lives. That's where my passion comes in from education because it wasn't that the students couldn't do it. It was because they didn't have an educator who was brilliant enough to push them to excellence, which is why I give my students my all. Well, you know, I, I want to dive into that a little bit about, about your your childhood, your experience growing up. So let, I want to talk first about, you know, just your experience in education. Like, what was school like for you growing up? I was a pretty good are you, are you from South Carolina? I'm from North Carolina. Originally. North Carolina. Born and raised? Born and raised. Um, I grew up, born in Edith, North Carolina, grew up my whole entire life in Proclamus County, North Carolina. I was a pretty busy kid, but I was, I was busy. I was intelligent, um, but I was also troubled. I was very talkative. I was bounced all over the place. And I never forget. Surprise, that. surprise. But right. It's crazy. This is why all my past educators laugh. And they're like, Michael is this, this is this educator. Like, look at him. In third grade, I was cutting up one day, Todd, being talkative playing around on the lesson, not listening to Mrs. Lane, who I know to this day. She called my mother. My mother was peeping through the door and came in. At this point in time, my mother just got her degree in social work and is eventually becoming a counselor. So she was working in the school system then. She came in and she watched me. And this is no lie. We can get her on camera and tell her this story. I told her, hey, mom, I'm the class clown. And my little kids start laughing clean. Teammates start laughing, classmates. Um, and the look on my mother's face of devastation and disappointment. She was like, no, you're no, you're not the class clown, Mike. In fact, who's the smartest kid in this classroom? So I had to look around, and at this point in time, his name was Aaron Lane, right? She was like, I need you to do everything that Aaron Lane does from now on. Don't be the class clown. If you become the class clown, me and your father are both going to get you. My father can come because he was driving trucks. But she said, whatever Aaron Lane do, you make sure you do every single day. And Aaron Lane will come in, he'll laugh, but he'll get to work. He'll go through his reading. He'll read big, giant, thick chapter books. And at that point in time, I was reading you know, books that weren't that in-depth and rigorous. And man, that moment was my parents waking me up like, hey, you know, you need to value education. And it sort of began to change with me in that. And she used to tell me, Michael, you have it better than some of your friends. And I didn't understand what she was saying. But most of my friends come from a single parent household at that time. Uh, most of them were living in some very dire situations. But I thought they were being offensive by saying, you know, we are different. But in fact, she was telling me that as we got older and as we know statistically, more than likely, I am going to fare off well if I continually work hard. And in that moment, she didn't recognize that she was opening up my world to what equity truly looks like. And that is what really made a big impact. Um, and that's why I believe if you guys ever come to a conference and you see my parents, you will automatically fall in love with them. 
automatically fall in love with them. My father didn't have his father growing up at all. My father saw his father beat his mother. I mean, his, yeah, his mom, um, my mother's mother, my grandmother had her at 14 years old. So both of my parents came from these rough situations, but they joined together and made up in their mind, you know, we want to raise our four or five children to have the best potential possible to make a difference in this world. And here I am. So, so I know I you're, know really you're close with your mother. So what would what you say is the biggest big lesson, lesson you've learned from, from your mom? Perseverance. That's why I'm so comfortable, Ty, with, um, I'm so comfortable with like a wave, with success and with going on Ellen and stuff. If people, ever, if you're watching this right now, I want you to understand this. When big moments happen, people rush in to try to figure out who you are and to be close to you because you had this moment. But eventually the wave will die down. One of the greatest, one of my mentors who's a phenomenal educator said, as long as you keep the focus on the kids, people will genuinely, that are really involved in education, will jump in towards and always cling towards you and support you. But it's the moment that you make it about yourself, people will back away to begin to understand what's real. Um, so within that moment, man, I just begin to recognize uh, that as an educator, I have this huge chance to really influence every person I come across. And uh, that's just where my mind has been at, man. Yeah. This I love that. So, you know, <clears throat> when you, you said you were a psychology major, so obviously education wasn't necessarily your first choice, was it? No. I was trying so to what led you to be an educator? I'm trying to go to the NBA. Because once again, media, what you see, all I saw was mainly successful African-American men doing in my small county was playing basketball. Didn't want to be a rapper, couldn't rap, right? That's why it's funny if you look at headlines of what happened in the Ellen moment, rapping teacher, so stereotypical. No, I can't rap, you guys. Um, but I was going to go to NBA because I wanted to take care of my family. You know, mm -hmm. we did not, when I was growing up before my mother went back to college, we weren't poor, but we weren't living in the best situations or conditions. You know, we was a huge family, six of us trying to make it happen. Um, but then I transitioned to clinical psychology because I saw they make six figures in high school. I could go in college and major in psychology, but because I didn't have a guidance counselor who understood equity within that moment, they didn't tell me that you would probably need a master's degree to tag along with the bachelor's in order to make the six figures. And once I got tired of writing those papers and knowing that I didn't want to sit with educators all day, I mean, with adults all day, listen to their problems, I thought of what do I love to do? And one thing I love to do is just hang with kids and laugh at them and build relationships with them. Hands down, probably one of my strongest points. If you ever see me, I can go into any, I can literally go into any school and have a camera follow me and kids automatically gravitate towards me. Mm -hmm. And that's just my God-given gift. So once I understood that, I was like, oh, I'll become a teacher. When I first became a teacher, Todd, in North Carolina, they paid us $30,500. Wow. And I didn't even care because I was making 400 every two weeks anyway from Hibbets or for the month. So I'm like, that's money. What, $2,000 for the month? They know about taxes and stuff, but um, that's when I began into education. So I never got into it for the money. I never got into it for the fame. I literally got into it because I really enjoy kids and I understand how big of an impact you can make. Well, you know, I, I want to I want to mention something that you mentioned. You know, you said you know, growing up, um, being a uh, a young African American male, you, you you thought I had to be a basketball star because this is what I see other men of color doing. And now you work with kids who are a lot of them are kids of color. And so, so what kind of message do you do? What? And not by not by choice either. So we can dive into that too. Just want to tell the story. But I, I know I'm sorry to mean to cut you off. I know. What no. You're um, this is about you. You cut me off whenever you want, Michael. You. Oh my gosh, I want to get into it because forget. I want to kill every stereotype. So first off, um, I almost knocked my lap back. Real quick. <laughs> You're about to start preaching. I can feel it. I swear, like because at my school is 98% African American. But check this out, people. It's not because that's just how the school is. The county drew the lines three different times since I've been a teacher. So. It's not their fault that the school is majority African-American. It's not my fault that you don't see diversity within my videos. I want diversity. If you hear my speeches, I love the inclusion of all cultures because you can learn, right? But I work with what I work with, and I believe in making the best of the situation. The school that I work at right now is South Greenwood Elementary. The county came to a job fair to recruit teachers. I said I wanted to work within this county. Check this out with marginalization. The rest of my friends were able to get job interviews at predominant schools in Greenville, Wintergreen, Eastern, and different areas of that magnitude. They set their job interviews up there. 
tell me why they only set my job interview up at South Greenville Elementary School. Because I'm an African-American male and they know of influence. And I've been running into that inside of education. That is why I'm apprehensive about getting my administration degree because in the education field, we're not as culturally diverse or aware of our actions every single day. And I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I have never, I've only seen two African-American superintendents my entire life. I've spoken at over 40 districts since that moment. I have never ever in my life, and I would love anybody to message me and send me, I have never seen an African-American man leading a school where the demographic does not reflect him, right? So in this moment, I've been trying to navigate those spaces. And most importantly, with the kids at my school, I know I have a lot of African-American boys that look up to me, so I do wear suits. You know, we have conversations about money. I do may go to the bank and pull money out because I need to replace all those visualizations and even implicit bias that they may be operating in. If you hear any of my keynote speeches, some images and things they see from culture and media that influence how they think. Um, and, and I just take that very seriously. I take it to heart um, and I embrace that um, and I, I accept that. So today we were talking about it because um, they were fussing about, not fussing, they were having a conversation about how they got on Jordans and somebody has on LeBron's. And I began asking them, hey, you guys know that, that that's not a solid company. Like Jordan and LeBron are under Nike. It was like, what? Yeah, he's, they're under Nike. They signed a deal with Nike. So they were still frowning. So <laughs> it was a perfect opportunity because as their teacher and as a successful African-American male, I was like, well, hey, Mr. Bonner has a legitimized company according to the legal firms in the United States Treasury in Washington, D.C. It's called Bonneville. I built it for you guys. I'm a teacher. I'm a speaker. I'm an author. I take pictures. And all of those separate entities fall under Bonneville, which makes the big giant company. And it went from that conversation to, oh, my gosh. So, Mr. Bonner, I can own a company. And if I'm big enough, does that mean that I can buy other companies? Yes, baby. You can. Your idea can buy other companies. Wow. So that means can I partner with other companies and we put ideas? Like that, me being who I am, allow that critical conversation happen today, which more than likely is not truly uh, celebrated inside of the education system. Right, right. So yeah, I'm sorry, I had a little rant, man, but I. Oh. No, well, you know, I, 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 I want to pivot off of that real quick. One thing I want to ask is, um, you know, when I think about your speaking, and you know, you and I have kind of have talked about this before. You know, you are a successful black man who's going in front of, and a lot of the people you're speaking in front of are are, are white or are, 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 are female educators. And do you ever feel like your voice isn't as valued because they think, well, that's a black man. He can connect with those black kids much easier. That's why he, let me just, I don't have to listen to him. Like, do you run into that too and in, in all the speaking you do? Don Combs. P. Diddy says, your energy introduces you before you do. And to the beautiful people watching this, please hear my heart in this. I was receiving so many crazy looks and not being valued as who I am, even after Ellen, it started to mess with me. I had to text Juan Clark one day, and Mr. Clark, I may be respectful, and like, hey, this is happening. Like, how do I deal? How do I deal with going in a space where I'm giving a keynote to a thousand people who do not look like me? And you see people rolling their eyes when you're talking about equity. You see men smirking and laughing when you're talking about how we should treat all of our students fairly, even though you have data to prove and show them that students of color, not just African American students, are being mistreated unfairly inside this education system. And man, it was it was it was almost to the point that I literally you can ask. Dr. Valerie Jones, you can ask uh, other educators that I truly trust. Um, man, it started to mess with my mind, man. Like it really began to mess with me. And I try to get people to understand this, to understand how I feel sometimes, now I've gotten over it, how I was feeling and talking to people in a majority crowd that does not look like me. I want you to go, Sunday is the most segregated day in the United States when people go to church. Go to a church where nobody looks like you and tell me your initial feeling as you walk in and how people look at you. It will begin to mess with you mentally because you can't read that they like me. Was whoa, why they why they frowning up at me like that? Is it you know? And and it really had. I had to get to a point where I had to pray before I get up and speak. I had to gather myself before I get up and speak, and I had to make sure I deliver a message that's true, a message that not only entertains but empowers, a message that not only convicts but uplifts people because that's what it's really all about. I don't leave my kids and go give these speeches for clout. I don't leave my kids and go give these speeches for followers and likes. You can buy followers and likes. I know enough people to get connections, to get verified. I do this, man, because I truly care about my kids. I care about the profession of education. 
I want to be comfortable and sleep at night when I have beautiful melanin filled chocolate babies, knowing that they can go into any school and they will be treated fairly and know that they will have the best opportunity positioned or presented to them because they have teachers around them that actually care about them. That's why I started this podcast by saying, I, I really do this because I have found that most people give theories on social media and give a beautiful caption, but you don't have the wherewithal or perseverance to go into a school system and implement what you're trying to tweet out. Period. Well, and, and I think it's powerful for you to be able to share that, you know, when you get when you've gotten that pushback because of your age or you being a man in education or you being a, a man of color, that it it does affect you. And you do have to find ways to separate yourself from their biases and their judgment to just be who you are and not change who you are to fit what they want you to be. And it's so tired. It was, and it was to the point, man, it was just very white uh, teacher in Charlotte, North Carolina, known for doing the head and shakes on Good Morning America. Mm -hmm. they, I was getting so confused. I was getting confused with Barry White. So people would come up to me and say, hey, you want to do a handshake? And I'm like, that, that's not me. Like, that's yeah. not me, right? Or or I remember when I went to get your teacher on and I had people literally walk up saying, hey, Mr. Elementary Math. If you I remember you telling me that. You were like, everybody thinks I'm Greg. <laughs> crazy. If you put me, Greg, and Barry White beside each other, it ne we do not look anything alike. But check this out. When do you ever hear people calling uh, – Wade King, Joe Dombrowski. Yeah. You, you don't. When do you ever hear uh, people mistaking me, <laughs> mistaking the time that's lonely for Ron Clark? Like, it just doesn't happen, right? right. So get into those spaces of how can I um, show that I bring value? And most importantly, how can I give people something to really take home and to put inside of their heart and really begin to implement? And I really want people to think about that because if we look at the data right now, and this is the crazy thing what I've been learning. Implicit bias shows us that students of color are being suspended at a disproportionate rate than any other subgroup inside of America. I mean, I mean it just is what it is. And it's funny because in education, we always want to talk about data, but there's certain data that we don't want to address. But this is something we have to address because in 2014, USA Today wrote an article stating that the Caucasian sub-ethnic uh, group is no longer the majority within the school system. Mm -hmm. If we're having a problem with suspending students of color more, and our school systems are coming more diverse, more than likely, the more suspensions we know, more than likely your academic scores are not going to be there because the kids are always gone. So if we don't interrupt this problem now, we have a huge problem that's going to be boiling in the education system with America. And I just want us to really begin to look at that. You know, Can you be comfortable with sending your child to any school to make sure they're getting the best education possible? And right now, we're just not at that moment in America. And that's why I get out and speak. That's why we have amazing administrators like you to get out and lead school systems to try to create some equity and liberation within our world, man. Well, you know, and, and I think it's such an important conversation to have, and I think all of us need to be having it. We can't, and you know, when I had um, Lanisha on here, she said, you know, we, we can't just rely on the teachers of color to have these conversations for us. Like everybody needs to get in there and be talking about it and be learning and growing. Um, and, you know, and, we fight battles, me and you both, all the time. I mean, even in our own districts, I'm sure there are many battles of people who have very antiquated or closed minded beliefs about um, different biases. Right. And it's like, you know, we're trying to break down boundaries even where we are. But that's why, even when I speak, I mean, I'm very passionate about bringing the conversation up all the time. I don't care who it's going to make comfortable, I don't care who's going to push out of their, uh, out of their normal zone. Because I'm always of that belief of until you are uncomfortable, you're not learning. And if all the conversations you're having are conversations that make you feel good, then how are you pushing your own thoughts and beliefs about things? And, and you know, and, and it's so much of what you said. I mean, because like exactly what you said just a second ago, you know, as a white male in America, I have never been confused for somebody else. And, and, and I've never had besides when I've attended an African-American church, I've never walked into a space where there wasn't other people who look like me. Right. And, I, and, I, and I just don't bring that understanding of what it's like to go stand in front of a thousand people and see a couple of faces that you recognize, but that's it. Right. And to know that I know I'm, I'm standing out right now and this is uncomfortable and who knows what they're going to say about me or what they're going to believe or the judgment they're going to bring. And that's such a 
It's such a hard thing for white people to understand. Yeah, and and that's why I try to talk to them and and eat to them in, as far as in the, the the subgroup of the Caucasian people. Everybody knows I I love I literally do love everybody. Like, mm-hmm. and I even put inside of my book. Um, my favorite teacher was a five five Caucasian lady, English four, Jenny Dunbar. My college professor, J- uh, Linda Willard, uh, a Caucasian woman. The reason why they were my favorite is because I wasn't even paying attention to their skin tone. They loved me in such a way and talked about equity in such a way and pushed me in such a loving way that it made a difference in my life. I wasn't even caring about that to the point if you bother them, we have to fight. So when I talk about equity and things, I don't want people to come off as, oh, he's about to start talking about a situation. I want people to understand I'm just trying to bring light to what people experience every single day. I was so honest about the sweetheart of my class that I posted on Instagram, a beautiful Hispanic little girl. In my classroom, we were doing majority African-American, Caucasian whole group responses or content. If you look at most educated, like right now, it's Spanish Heritage Month, right? Mm-hmm. We don't see anything on social media going viral. There's teachers doing it. We don't see any people pushing it like it should be pushed. Their culture matters, too. Specifically, what's going on at the border right now? They're dealing with true trauma. I just saw a video of a ten-year-old being reunited with his mother, and they or he was legal. He had a right to be here. Mother right. tears. So I found myself in class excluding her, but not on purpose. Subconsciously, I was doing it with my content pedagogy, and I had to say to myself, "Oh, I wanted that she feel like I felt when I had to go and do a keynote in front of people that I I don't know that look nothing like me. I wondered that she feel how I feel." When I have to participate in conversation and I don't know the vernacular, I don't know the, the different coded languages being used. So I had to, it, this year has really been challenging me. How can I really get into culturally responsive teaching? Everybody talks about culturally responsive teaching and cultural competence, but we don't understand in order to achieve those things, you have to become a part of that culture and actually learn it. So I have been going out to the, my friends that work at the Mexican restaurants and stuff. Hey, what does this mean? Okay, what if, I didn't even know. It meant, I went and spoke in Arizona. I didn't know in Mexico. Or here, it's almost offensive to give them a can of Coke. They take bottled Coke because in America, they use corn syrup. In Mexico, they use actual real sugar to make their Coca-Cola. So over here, you give them a can of Coke, they go, it's almost little. Or inside of the African-American culture, sarcasm does not translate well. Uh-huh. You be sarcastic with certain people, you know, you will find yourself ruffling some feathers because it's taken as, oh, you're trying to try me mm-hmm. and not respect me as a person to think everything is a joke. So... I've been challenging myself in so many ways, man. And I want all educators to do that, even inside of my own pedagogy. This year, I've been trying to work on building more creative lessons. I have relationships packed down. I have breaking down quantitative and qualitative down to make sure I'm more effective. I have relating across cultures down. I want to begin lessons, not only just a classroom transformation, but lessons where true learning actually takes place at. One of the best lessons this year came up from political cartoon. It blew my mind. It was a picture of Colin Kaepernick on a knee uh, Donald Trump pointed to him saying you're dumb and D- LeBron James pointed to Donald Trump saying you're dividing America. So many images and messages within that picture. Um, but the conversation led on and they were giving their own thoughts sort of doing Socratic circle. And then one young man in my classroom finally said, well, Mr. Bond, in regards to terrorists, are all Muslims terrorists? And I'm like, boom, that's a perfect lesson right there. That was that wasn't necessarily tied to my class being transformed. I didn't have everybody with their own interactive notebooks. Just a simple question. I was able from a cartoon to begin to kill a bias that he has in his mind and really begin to instruct him about, you know, what is a Muslim? You know, how, what does it mean to be categorized as a terrorist? And how can we help other people understand and help them grow? If you ask me, that's where true learning begins to take place at, man. And, you know, and, and Sara Ahmed recently released a book called Being the Change. And it is, a, it is a book that does exactly like that. Like, how do we have those conversations in class and tie it into all of our instruction? Because it's so important for our kids to be doing that. But I love that you brought that up because, you know, that's really been our school focus this year is having that idea of we need to understand culturally responsiveness. Like, we need to understand other cultures because every culture learns differently. And we have to be bringing in those experiences and those ideas and resources. And, and it's like we can't do – one size fits all education. And until you educate yourself, you're not going to change any of that. That's why I respect Ron Clark and Kim Bearden. I've been on record for that. Not only do they speak, but they still teach. And I've seen, not only do they still teach, you can drop them jokers in any demographic or population and they can make change happen. That's yep. what counts as a phenomenal and a great teacher to me. So the people that you look up to and even yourself, 
can you be poured into any demographic or population and still produce phenomenal results? Mm -hmm. That's what that's the line that you judge if you're a great educator or not. Not by how many followers you have, not if you're verified, not if you uh, are sponsored, not if you've been viral before, not if people know you, not if you have phenomenal connections or you know the Austin Ted, uh, Todd, that's lonely. If not, if not if you know those things, what really counts is can we literally pick you up and drop you in any school and you begin to permeate change? And if that answer is no, you have some work to do. And that's why I'm working on myself. I love it. So, so I want to end with one final question, Michael. Um, for our listeners or viewers that are watching or listening to this right now, what is one thing that you hope that they walk away with from your story? One thing I hope they walk away with from my story. They could walk away with so much from my story. Mm -hmm. um, but what I, what I want people to really fully understand is who you are as it, the moment that I went viral with Ellen DeGeneres, I need people to understand I was already teaching there for three years and I've been teaching for six years. My students, the type of students I served didn't change. We didn't get a new school building that changed. We didn't get any uh, new resources or technology that changed. In fact, I have had 11 different principals in my six years of teaching in four different grade level teams. So there's always chaos that has been going on around me at South Green. The only thing that you can take from my story is the only thing that changed and brought this phenomenal moment that happened was me. Mm -hmm. I changed. I changed my mind. I changed who I was. I changed how I approached education. I changed how I built relationships with students. I changed how I approached this world. I changed how I began to live my life. I have been through a divorce at an early age. I have dealt with my parents being sick. I have dealt with wanting to quit teaching. I have dealt with not knowing my purpose in life. And I got to a point where I said, you know what? I don't want to wake up every day as if it's an accident anymore. When I wake up tomorrow, I want to know I'm about to make change happen and people are waiting for me to come around because they know I'm going to provide a positive experience for them. I need people to understand that you can shift your entire world if you change. Mm -hmm. Facts. And if you need a blueprint or need a proof of that, you can literally look at my life and you will begin to see how things can gradually change if you change. I was scared to give a 20 minute I was scared to give a 20 minute speech when I first began speaking. All my mentors told me was tell stories. So you throw me on stage in front of people and say just tell stories. And I've been so grateful that I've been able to speak in so many different places and even become a better educator. My test scores doubled last year. Like all because I changed. You want true change to happen around you, you change. Well I gotta say, you know Michael, that um you know I in my view you are like in the top five men that I look up to in this career, but also not only that, but just the you, it personally because of the heart that you bring um, and the time that I've I had the opportunity to spend time with you, just seeing how every single ounce of emotion that you poured into this conversation tonight, it's like that is you. That is real. It's not a show. And I've met so many people in this field traveling and speaking that that are not the same as the person they portray on social media or on stage. And I just, I got to say that, you know, for me, that's why I, I was, I was really excited and honored that you said yes to come on because I just, I know you've only got a couple years under your belt um, and then I'm older than you too, but I just, I truly admire your tenacity, the, the honesty, the vulnerability, all of that, because you have helped me grow into a better educator and not, and, and I, and I know that I've never even expressed it to you. Like you don't even know the impact you had because of all the things you are doing that I've been able to see from afar, but also come into your circle a little bit and see. And so I personally just want to tell you, thank you for the work that you are doing for your babies at your school. Thank you for your bravery and getting out there and sharing your story honestly and openly and just with such heart and genuineness. Um, I know that you will never understand the lives that you impact, but I appreciate you continuing to use your voice. And, and same to you, man. And I want to make sure I end, answer this question by Janet L. Carter. And I hope you're still watching, sweetheart. You said, so what is your best advice working with difficult kids? I know it's about relationships, but what are some good strategies to get them on board? People in education, Jenna, often tell kids, you need your education. But for what? You know, you have to begin to connect the end goal with an actual purpose. So if you notice what Ellen and I said, 
I took money to school. I took money to school because I began to connect with children. Knowledge can bring you wealth. Everybody has beautiful ideas. You come to school to begin to train your brain how to properly think and how to figure out solutions to become who they are. So if you have difficult children in your classroom, they don't understand the value of education. You first need to find out what do they want to be. I want to be a lawyer. Oh, for real? You want to be a lawyer? Well, obviously, you need to learn how to sit first. Have you seen how much money lawyers make? Well, let's sit down and look at the skills that a lawyer needs because a lawyer is a great job. You have to buy into their dream. I know you can be a lawyer. You know what? You'll be a great lawyer. A lawyer needs to be able to read and comprehend the text. A lawyer needs to be able to speak, you know, emphatically and have deep vernacular inside of their lexicon in order to convey to the judge to release their client and start connecting it with them. And once you start connecting it with them, it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. I knew... Um, I began to connect deeper with speaking and giving keynote speeches when Kim Bearden told me that if I can reach one teacher, that one teacher reaches 30 students. If I can reach 10 teachers and each of them have 30 students, I believe last time I did most cases, there's 300 students that I have reached just by encouraging them. So you have to connect their education with an actual purpose. And once you do that, you will notice you're building a relationship with them. You know what they like. You know what they want to be. You begin to hold them accountable. You spend more time with them. You can begin to mold them. And before you know it, that child will turn for you. Yep. That's dead on. That is the perfect way to end this episode. Michael, thank you so much. Y'all can follow Michael on all the social media platforms and, and continue following along with his journey. But I appreciate you, man. And thank you, everybody, for checking out this episode of Tell Your Story. Remember, you can check out this episode and any previous episode, whether you want to watch on Facebook, YouTube, or subscribe on iTunes. Make sure you check out the book that this story, the series is based after, Stories from Web, where you can read the stories of 20 to 50 other educators who are sharing their stories. Stories from Web. Go get this book, people. There we go. I'm telling you, this, listen, this is probably one of the most, even Joe Dombrowski was talking about it, this is one of the best books that we have ever seen inside the education system because it's not self-serving. It is actually a book with teachers providing their opinions. Please support this. I even have my stories from the web sticker. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you. Look at you. I love it. So thank you so much, and we will see you all next week.